The Earth is a habitable planet and has been throughout most of its history. But what does it mean for a planet to be habitable? And how does a planet change with time? To answer these questions, sometimes it's useful to think of the opposite of habitable and imagine what that might look like. Now, imagine with me that you live in a village, a small village, and it's a healthy and prosperous place to live. And everybody is free to go about their day-to-day -day lives. However, nearby, you can see that there are the remains of another village. And it seems like that village was the same size as your village, except now it's burned to the ground. No one lives there, nor could they live there. It's completely uninhabitable. You ask the residents of your village, how did this happen? And nobody knows the answer. You ask, when did this happen? And still nobody knows. And then you ask the most important question. Could the same fate that befell that village happen to us? And no one has any idea. We are very fortunate to have within our solar system a twin planet. This twin planet is called Venus. It is the same size as the Earth and probably formed under very similar conditions. Raise your hand if you've ever seen Venus in the night sky. I can see a few hands. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, I actually have some good news for you. You're wrong. <laughs> Venus is the third brightest object in the sky, after only the sun and the moon. Many people have seen Venus, they just didn't know that they were seeing it. And it just so happens, it's very high right now, it doesn't set until about 11 p.m. And so after all of these talks and we're done for the evening, when you're outside, look to the west and you will see what appears to be a bright star just above the horizon. But it's not a star, it is our twin planet, Venus. Now, the reason that it looks so bright is because Venus is the closest planet to the Earth but it's also covered with a very reflective layer of clouds. Now, we don't really know what's going on with Venus. We do know that it is completely hostile, but this layer of clouds has prevented us from learning a lot of things about Venus. Now, although it's hostile now, it need not have always been that way. In fact, there are probably periods of its history when it had surface liquid water oceans much like the Earth. But the layer of clouds has presented this aura of mystery to us. And that mystery has been the source of creativity for so many science fiction writers over the years who have written stories about the prospect of life on Venus. There have been stories and even movies that have been produced about the possibility of life on the surface of Venus. For example, in 1959, there was a Three Stooges film called Have Rocket Will Travel. They had a completely bizarre adventure on the surface of our twin planet. In 1960, there was a movie called First Spaceship on Venus, where an international group of astronauts went to explore an ancient alien relic on the surface of Venus. And then the very last film that portrayed life on the surface of Venus was in 1965, Voyage to a Prehistoric Planet, in which it depicted dinosaurs on the surface of Venus. Now, the reason that that was the last movie that depicted life on the surface of Venus is because at that time, we were going through an extraordinary 
period of discovery. And we were finally learning what the surface of our sibling planet was actually like. During the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, NASA and Soviet Russia, they engaged in an intense period of Venus exploration. NASA launched several spacecraft called Mariner that flew past Venus and took our first measurements of the top and middle part of the Venetian atmosphere and gave us our first hints that the surface may be far more hostile than we previously imagined. Meanwhile, the Soviet Venera program was launching many spacecraft to Venus and they provided humanity's first soft landing on the surface of another planet in 1970. And soon afterwards, they returned our first pictures from the surface of another planet. This is what the Venera spacecraft saw when they landed, a barren, desolate landscape, completely hostile. The, the Venera landers experienced extreme temperatures and extreme pressures. They found that the average temperature on the surface of Venus is 850 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about the maximum temperature on the temperature gauge on my barbecue. <laughs> they also found that the pressure at the surface was about 94 times the atmospheric pressure at the surface of the Earth, which is equivalent to about one kilometer depth in the ocean which is far below the safe scuba diving depth. It also has 96% carbon dioxide atmosphere with sulfuric acid mist that exists within the middle atmosphere. Under these conditions, the Venera landers lasted a matter of hours. We had truly found the most hostile environment that we could possibly imagine within our solar system. And this presented an incredible challenge to how do we possibly comprehend such a hostile environment? How can we model it? How could we predict it elsewhere? And in fact, one of the world's leading climate scientists, Francois Forget, he said, if Venus did not exist within our solar system, then we would not dare to imagine it. What that means is that if you can imagine that the solar system does not have Venus, that it consists of Mercury, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and so on, then we would be far more cavalier about attributing habitability to the size of the planets. However, Venus is a warning to us. And the warning is, is that the size of the planet does not necessarily determine what the outcome of its evolution is. It does not guarantee planetary habitability. So why are these extraordinary differences between Earth and our twin planet? Well, this is the critical question. And this is such a critical question for our civilization to answer, because without answering it, we won't be able to understand the evolution of planets, including Earth, and we won't be able to predict these sorts of conditions elsewhere. Now, fundamentally, many people had attributed the differences down to the fact that Venus is 30% closer to the sun than Earth, and it receives almost twice the amount of solar energy. However, there are many other differences between Venus and Earth than simply distance from the sun. For example, Venus rotates very slowly, backward. It has almost no tilt to its axis which for Earth provides our seasonal variations. When we look at the surface, we don't see many signs of activity or plate tectonics. It has a negligible magnetic field and it doesn't have a substantial moon, which has played an important role in the evolution of Earth. So another way of thinking about this problem is that perhaps there are a sequence of processes that can lead to the divergence of two planets like Venus and Earth. 
because as I mentioned, Venus and Earth formed together under similar conditions and at the start at least, they probably looked identical, just like twins would. But then there were a series of processes that occurred that caused this significant divergence. Trying to find out what that process was that caused that divergence is the fundamental problem that we are trying to solve. However, there may be a different way of looking at this because after all, we only have two planets of that size in our solar system and there might be many pathways possible, many possible kinds of habitable planet and many different kinds of uninhabitable planet. So it could be that Venus and Earth are merely two examples that exist within a sea of infinite possibilities. Now, in order to answer that, if that is true, then we need to look beyond the solar system. Fortunately, we all live in extraordinary times because there has been a concerted effort in searching for planets around other stars in recent years, and these efforts have been amazingly successful. At the present time, we know of more than 5,000 planets orbiting other stars. They're a variety of sizes, and they orbit a variety of stars. Many of these planets are terrestrial, meaning that they are rocky like Venus or Earth. Now, planets which are the size of Venus and Earth, those are the hardest ones to find, but we're only just starting to scratch the surface. For example, when we look at some of the discoveries that have been produced by the NASA Kepler mission, which found many rocky planets, then it has found planets which are slightly smaller, than Earth and slightly larger than Earth. But the Kepler mission showed us that small planets like Earth are much more common than large planets like Jupiter. What we are trying to do now is to understand what the atmospheres of these rocky planets are like, whether their atmospheres more resemble Earth or whether they resemble Venus or maybe something else entirely. In order to do that, we take advantage of the movement of planets around their stars. In particular, when a planet moves between us and the star, then the light from the star passes through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to us. And when the light from the star passes through the planetary atmosphere, some of it is absorbed. And the absorbed light depends on the gases that are present and provide a unique signature of those gases and thereby reveal what the composition of that planetary atmosphere is. When we look at the spectrum of a planet, then we can see perhaps evidence that the atmosphere is dominated by carbon dioxide just like Venus or maybe that the signs of oxygen, or maybe even that the signs that the surface liquid water present on the planet. This example shown here is what an alien civilization would see if they took a spectrum of Earth. And you can see there, there's a variety of familiar features, one of which is of course, evidence of biological activity. Now, all of these pieces go together to form a picture of what that planet currently looks like and what its surface may be like. But it doesn't tell you about the history of the planet. And it doesn't tell you where that planet is headed. And so to fully exploit the data that we obtain from planetary atmospheres for planets around other stars, we need to go back to our solar system and fully understand why Venus and Earth are different from each other. Fortunately, we are embarking on a new journey with Venus. NASA has recently approved the development and launch of several new missions to our sister planet, Veritas and Da Vinci. Along with these two missions, the European Space Agency also approved 
a mission of their own called Envision. These three missions will explore Venus in more detail than ever before. They're going to provide us with high resolution maps of the surface that will allow us to determine if there is any geological activity, any motion of the surface, any evidence of plate tectonics, which has been so important for Earth in remaining habitable by removing carbon from the atmosphere. These missions will also teach us about the atmosphere of Venus its composition, its chemistry, and whether or not Venus did actually have surface liquid water sometime in its past. These missions represent a bold new step forward in our efforts to try to understand our sister planet. Planetary habitability is a privilege. It is not something that we've earned, and it's something that we would not be here without. It is a gift, and to fully appreciate the value of a gift, it is very important to consider the alternative. If Venus was indeed once like Earth, and then it evolved into its present hostile state, then it is critically important that we discover how and when this happened. Not just to understand the life within our solar system, but to understand how we effectively search for life in other planetary systems. So it is through the understanding of our twin planet that we will fully appreciate the habitable environment that we all now enjoy. Thank you very much.